Hello plant lovers, Matthew in Melbourne fighting my way through the undergrowth to say welcome to my channel. And if you're new, I grow cold, cool, intermediate orchids here in Melbourne without any humidifiers or greenhouses or grow lights. They're either indoors or outdoors or they're out of the pool. So if that's of any interest, I do post every week, hit subscribe. And now let's confront the elephant in the room. <laughs> Ta -da! Look at the size of this plant. It is enormous. And this is the first Australian native orchid that I bought. And it is, well, there is an interesting point. Let's say it's Dendrobium kingianum. But I really just wanted to show you the blooms. It is so floriferous. It is unbelievable. And this is a great season. So I'm just going to go through some of the basics. I have made a video about this before, but it was a while ago and I feel the resolution was terrible. <laughs> so I'm going to make another one anyway. So first, some background on dendrobiums in Australia. I mean, there are many, but the two species I guess that are grown most in cultivation are Kingianum and Speciosum. Kingianum tend to be smaller and creamier and whiter and mauve lilac-y and the Speciosum are those massive, sometimes called the Sydney rock orchid, I was going to say rock oyster, <laughs> rock orchid, massive, massive sprays of yellow to cream flowers, quite fragrant and the Speciosums are just giant plants, really huge and huge sprays of really quite large flowers. So they are quite different, but they have been hybridized tremendously to produce amazing Australian native orchid hybrids, which are fantastic in terms of their color, their fragrance, their shape, their form, etc. So there are amazing hybrids out there. But I just always assumed this was Dendrobium kingianum until plant lovers, I found in an op shop this book, Orchids of Australia. And it is really fantastic. All the illustrations are from the late 1930s and their botanic watercolors, quite sensational. And so the Kingianums and Speciosums are native to the east coast of Australia, from the north of Victoria, the state I'm in, all the way up the coast. And they are generally epiphytes and often lithophytes. And for some reason, I love a lithophyte. They are extremely tough because they are built to take Australia's conditions. So temperatures can get quite cold in winter. It can get really hot in summer. And depending on where they are, differing quantities of humidity. The further north you get, the more humid the environment becomes. And although this isn't a native to my part of the country, it does extremely well growing in Melbourne. There is a natural hybrid called Dendrobium delicatum, which is a natural hybrid occurring between Speciosum and Kingianum. And this baby fits the description perfectly. So given its size, its floriferousness, and the color and form of the flowers, I'm pretty convinced now that this is in fact Dendrobium delictum, which is a natural hybrid between those two. It doesn't really matter, it is sensational. Now, I do have a Kingianum, which is a really bright magenta color. And in fact, it's in bloom now. I'll see if I can go and get a shot for you. But there is a bit of a story about my other Kingianums. So let me just go over basic care again. These come from a variety of pretty tough environments, but essentially epiphytic or lithophytic, and they can form quite large colonies in the nook that they manage to find. They're all late winter or spring flowering, depending which part of the country you're in. And so the thing to remember about that is here we are in the Southern Hemisphere, the sun is quite low in winter. And although these are epiphytes or lithophytes, which means they're often quite shady, the sun is quite low. So they do get winter light. And that is the key to really great blossom. They need light, that simple. However, tough as they are, they will get sunburnt. And the leaves are really quite leathery and tough, but they will get sunburnt if they're in too much direct sun. But they're so tough, it probably won't kill them and they'll still bloom, but the leaves will be very yellow and they'll have black spots on them. So ideally what you want is strong winter light and then dappled light for the rest of the year. So really under a tree, which is kind of where they want to live, is the best spot for them. They get winter light and a bit of dappled protection and a little bit of protection from the rain. So the other thing is they do not want to sit in very damp medium because they're lithophytes or epiphytes. If you imagine, the rain coming down, they absorb as much as they can. And then it might be dry for quite a period of time. So they're used to dry, wet, dry, wet, but not staying in wet medium. So if you're growing these indoors, let them dry out between watering. Don't keep it soggy. They're really tough though. This is not an orchid you will kill by not watering it, believe me, unless you never water it. But if you went away for a month on holiday, it will still be fine when you come back. 
mine grows outside all year. It is slightly protected, so it doesn't get full on rain, but it does get rained on. It's elevated though, so it's in a free draining mixture, so the water doesn't sit in the pot. And of course, as we know, terracotta pots evaporate and drain really quickly. So that's quite useful in a natural environment. But you could certainly grow it in plastic and you could certainly grow it indoors. The only thing is you're gonna have to figure out how to give the plant winter sun. So the flowers are beautiful. As you can see, they're basically white, but with a little bit of a hint of lilac to them. And there is a fragrance. Again, it, it's, it's like a light springy daffodilly fragrance, if that makes any sense. It's not overpowering, but I used to bring this in when the plant was smaller inside the house to enjoy the blooms. And there would be a gentle, beautiful aroma in the room. So it's not overpowering. It's very gentle and it's gorgeous. The plant flowers from the tips of its canes and Importantly and interestingly and fantastically, it can continue to flower year on, year on from that same cane. So the more canes you have, the more flowers you have. And the canes can last for years and years and years. So if you do do something terrible like get it sunburnt, you will have that cane to remind you for quite some time. So light we have covered, winter light vital, water we've covered, nah they're not that fussy. They live in quite extreme climates. If you're growing it indoors though, I would let it dry reasonably between each watering and don't keep the medium soggy wet. And temperature wise, gee, these are tough. Depending which part of the country they're growing, they can get quite low winter minimum nighttime temperatures and really high summer maximum temperatures and a whole raft of humidity in between. It can take the heat and it can take cold to a degree. Now mine is outside all year and in Melbourne in winter, our lowest minimums can be around one, two degrees Celsius, which is 36, 38 degrees Fahrenheit. So not quite freezing, but almost. Like many dendrobiums, these produce cakeys from the tip of the spike. And it will particularly do that if it's not getting enough light and if it's too wet. So bear that in mind. If you're getting lots of cakeys, it probably means something is wrong with the environment you're giving it. And with cultivating them, it is so simple. You wait till the cakey has got some roots and you just snap it off and stick it in the pot and Bob's your uncle. No special care. I've grown many a cakey and given them on to friends and they do incredibly well, very easy to propagate. Fertilizer wise, when I repotted this, I put some slow release granules into the mix, but that was a while ago and I'm not gonna repot this baby, let me tell you, because it is so massive. But what I do do every spring and autumn is give it a topical dressing of granules of a slow release fertilizer. And I give this a little bit more than I would my other orchids, just because the plant is so big and there's such a lot going on every year. So I'd normally just put maybe two or three grains in a regular orchid, this, I put more like half a teaspoon. And then occasionally, if I remember during the year, I will give it a liquid fertilizing watering. And that's usually with a seaweed based fertilizer for these ones outside. And that is diluted to one eighth of the recommended dose on the bottle. But as you can see, tough as nuts and loving life. And then medium wise, bear in mind, it's an epiphyte, lithophyte in its natural environment. So anything large, chunky and free draining is gonna be fine. And you know what I use for these? <gasps> out of the bag orchid mix from the hardware store. Nothing fancy for my dendrobium kingianums. I've been buying a few of the hybrids just to see what they're gonna do. And I will show you this one that is in bloom right now. And plant lovers, I just wanted to show you this fabulous little kingianum. Look at that. This is helpfully described as a hybrid. So that's what it is. It's a dendrobium kingianum hybrid, but look at those beautiful flowers. So they are a very pale pink speckled with magenta. On the back of the flower, you can see there's a much stronger color. It's quite beautiful. Not a great show because here in my rental garden, I actually can't give it the right amount of winter sun that it needs. So it's a bit of a patchy bloomer at the moment, but hopefully this time next year we'll be in our new place and I can give my King Yarnums all the winter sun that they need. So the problem I am having is that I'm in a rental while we're renovating a house 
and it means that it is really difficult for me outside to find the space to give these Australian orchids the winter light that they need. So what I've just resigned myself to is that they're not gonna bloom really well in this environment until we move. What it does mean though is I'm getting lots of cakeys, so I'm getting lots of spare plants. So there you go, I'll be giving those away. But the sad thing is it means that I just don't get great blooms. This one, however, is in the only spot that does get really good winter light, hence it has the most amazing display of flowers. And and then pest wise, really, I don't have any problem with this. I think because it's growing outside, natural predators deal with anything that might decide to have a go at it. The only problem I have had is the odd possum having a sniff around, but I've never really noticed anything growing on it. I've never noticed slug or snail damage. Caterpillars don't seem to like the leaves because they're really quite tough. But I imagine if you're growing it indoors, it will probably be subject to the usual sort of pests that you could get inside. But I don't know because I've never had any. There we are, this is my Dendrobium delicatum, which I think it is, rather than Kingianum. Either way, I don't care, it's fabulous. Very vigorous grower, as you can see, I actually can't lift it up because it is so massive. It produces numerous canes every year, and as I said, each cane is capable of flowering repeatedly until the cane dies, which can take years. So, they are really great plants for bang for buck and amazing displays. The canes are capable of flowering once they've matured, which generally only takes a season, so that's pretty quick. There we are, plant lovers. Dendrobium. Isn't it beautiful? It is the season. It's spring here in Australia, and they're all coming out doing their thing. In warmer parts of the country, they've been in bloom for a lot earlier, and in colder parts, it'll be a lot later. Just depends on the locality you're in. But for me, super easy to grow. I really don't do anything. There we are, plant lovers. Matthew and my dendrobium saying thank you very much for watching. Do hit subscribe if you want to follow my continuing very amateurish orchid adventures. And I look forward to seeing you next week.